<laughs> okay, here we go. So tonight we're going to talk about New York. We have, um, and thank, I thank all y'all for taking the time out to come listen to me run my mouth. I appreciate that. Um, I hope, I hope that in the course of this, that we, that I say something that might help us enjoy, enjoy some neat stuff about life. I mean, that's what it's all got to be about. Let's see. There are several things that occur in the Lord that we, we really don't really pay attention to very often. One of them is New York. And I'm going to start with the pros edit, like I always do, with regards to where he comes from, who he is. And then we're going to just talk about some of these ideas that some people want to refer to as esoteric, maybe at the borders of science itself. But in the long run, when, you, when, when I'm, I'm going to try to tie them all together here, and maybe we can weave another brush stroke on that canvas of inspiration that we all hoped for when we jumped in for this new path of life. So it said, then said Gangleri, I would ask tidings from of more Aesir. Har replied, the second son of Odin's daughter. Shit, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> the third among the Aesir is he that is called Njord. He dwells in heaven, in the abode called Northa. He rules the course of the wind. That's a flow of energy across the surface of the world that I've talked about many times. When you look at the rotation of storms in the northern hemisphere, and the rotation of storms in the southern hemisphere, they rotate from the poles to the equator and back, from the poles to the equator and back, and always rotate in a certain direction. And it mirrors the flow of water in that part of the world. It mirrors the structure of our DNA and the spire and that spiral design that we see. It shows up in those spirals that we see carved in stone literally all over the world that spiral design, this flow of water, this course of the wind, and they tie together. He steals the sea and fire. That's such a powerful statement in just four words. Nunganungangath and that great yawning void, there are two elements. There is ice, which is solid from the water, and there's fire. Nobody created that. It's there. Here we have a God that stills the sea and the fire. There's an amazing amount of authority in such a concept. Nobody created this water. Nobody started this fire. It's there from the beginning. All of the runes in the Elder Futhark can be created using the symbols for ice and fire, Kinaz and Isa. So, here we have a God, and in just those four words that we a lot of times skip over, here's a God that controls that. He still see and fire. On him shall men call for voyages and for hunting. Uh, the ability of a man to float out to sea, to go on a great voyage, to go conquering, to conquer a foreign land, or even just to go fishing. And for success in the hunt. Um, that's abundance in any village. If you're in a tribe or in a community and you live at the edge of the sea and you make that offering and you have that success on your voyage for fishing, for, for if you want to go a harrying and go a viking, if you want to go hunting, and all, and so he still the sea and fire, he, men shall call on him for voyage and for hunting. He is so prosperous and abounding in wealth. What an amazing idea. Well, where does that wealth come from? Some of it, Rand gets most of uh, what sinks, she has that, that afterlife that her sailors caught in her net and the treasures that her net catches. Um, but there's other treasures in the sea. There's other energies in the sea that we're going to get into. It's abounding in wealth, it's prosperous. It's a realm that's, that's so prosperous that I spoke about it in, blind, in the book, Blind in One Eye, the, the whale was at one time a land animal. And if you look at their carcass today, you can see the remnants of a hip bone. And they returned to the sea. They returned to this huge, great volume of water. 70% of the earth is covered in water. 70% of our body is made up in water. There's some things that tie together there. But the whale re-entered the ocean and became the largest living animal in the world. It adapted to its environment. And as I, I 
in that interview I talked to Steve the other day, we're kind of in the same boat now. We are evolving, I want to say evolving, we are moving into a new realm of our own with regards to our spirituality. Do we have what it takes to adapt to that spirituality and become that great magnificent creature that the whale has done in the ocean, in the seas? There's a lot of imagery associated between the two. The thing is so large, its tongue weighs as much as three elephants. Its, it's heart is as big as a car. A man can swim through his blood vessels, but we don't know where they go to breathe. So there's this potential for greatness, and there's still this hint of mystery that I think accompanies our quest for spirituality in this new faith. What a wonderful idea that I think it enchants the minds of, of many. Mm, so I'll continue on and tell you. And that he give them plenty of lands or of gear and him shall men invoke for such things. So not only does he have control over these things, not only is he this God of abundance and everything, he also helps him with the lands and the gear what they need to use, the tools they need to use to become something more. Well, if he controls sea and fire, fire and ice, Nas and Isa, now that's the foundation of all these runes. Now all of a sudden these tools that the runes represent, here's a God that might have some input on how we use that tool to adapt to this grand new spiritual realm we want to engage in. Njord is not of the race of the Osir. He was reared in the land of the Vanir, but the Vanir delivered him as a hostage to the gods and took for hostage in exchange him that men call home. Now, Will brought this up this morning. It's a very interesting point. When we look at Odin and Honir and Lothir, or Odin, Billy, and Bay, they are the ones that carved these beings out of either driftwood or a living tree, the ash and the elm, ash and the and gave them these wonderful gifts. One of them being goodly hue and color, this flow of energy, life, the, the blood that flows through our veins. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get into that just yet. Owner is given away, and this great being that controls all of these aspects of abundance, um, becomes a part of the tribe to make the tribe stronger. There's no small amount of thought given to by Odin as to who is welcomed into the tribe. These great high-minded, kind of distant, austere, um, sky god, very cerebral aspects to them, very martial aspects to them. Um, in exchange, they get these ideas of abundance, of prosperity, of love. They kind of soften the edges, so to speak. They kind of strengthen the tribe in ways that you can't do if it's an entirely martial aspect. That give it hope. They give it love. They give it the ability to support each other, to show compassion, to care, and to have that wealth of an existence that the whale enjoys in the sea. Because we've got to remember that as Odin sat on the mountain, Happy as boyhood, as a child on the side of the hill, as young men play through the fields, they're happy. There's not a care in the world. Soon blinded, he seemed, and he sought refuge in the sea. He gathered his assembled host and took all of his people, his tribe, his community. They also returned to the oceans. Njord went and visited, I guess, the cousin of his cousin, this wild being eager that controlled the wild and powerful oceans. <coughs> In that sea, all these positive aspects of, of what we all are made of. These gods, these goddesses, what they represent, what they, the thoughts they think, the thoughts that we think. Do we create a welcoming table in this sea of our own thoughts, as Eager did in his sea? These things kind of tie together and they spark my imagination, and I hope that they spark yours as well. Odin took a representative of that into his tribe to help build a stronger tribe, to help build stronger thoughts. And it was resisted, but it wasn't resisted in the way most people think. So New York's children are Frey and Freya. These are gods of spring rains and abundance and crops and fertility and love and all of these wonderful things that make life worth living between two people. The very examples that they give about 
what they are, the responsibilities they have. Freya's daughters literally mean treasure. Their daughters are a treasure to the world, something beautiful to see, like a woman painting on in a, in a still painting. Beauty is always portrayed as a still image. Men are always portrayed in action. Freya is the mother of that, of that feeling in our heart when we look upon something strong and beautiful. Freya is that God that brings that gentle rain. No woman has ever cried over him. He is the Lord of Alpine, the gift of a, of a lost tomb. When you compare that to Thor and Tyr and Odin himself, you really get this idea. Now Odin has built a well-rounded community, like we are trying to build a well-rounded individual, strong and beautiful. And Yord is a crucial part of that. That's why he is listed as third here, because he's, he's not listed. He is third among the Aesir, though he was offered as a hostage. In later parts of the story, he becomes a full-on member of the community. And it's not a big deal. <clears throat> he became an atoma between the gods and the Vanir. So he created this very unifying aspect between the sky and the earth and the sea. What an amazing thought. Njord has to wife the woman called Scotty, the daughter of Thiazi the giant. Scotty would fain dwell in the abode which her father had had. And I've written a lot about that. It's on a certain mountain in the place called Thrymim. New York would be near the sea. They made a compact on these terms. They should be nine nights in Thrymimir, but the second nine at Noah time. But when New York came down from the mountain back to Noah time, he sang the slave. So he missed it. So here we have this, 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 this giantess, Scotty, who becomes a very prominent member of the Aesir. She's the one that affixes the snake above Loki's head that drops the venom on his face. She's the one that Loki tied a, a, a goat to his balls to get her to laugh. Her father's eyes are cast, or no, it's his toe, I think, in heaven where they might look at it. She might look at him all the time. When a daughter loses a father, she loses that individual that knows what she's going to think or say before she ever even thinks or says. And when they get married, more often than not, they're looking for a man that has that same ability. It's hard to express. It's hard to identify. Why doesn't he understand what I'm thinking? The only frame of reference a woman or a little girl ever has is her father. So when the Scotty loses her father, this is a big loss. Even though she lives in a grand castle and a fortress on top of the mountain, this is a big painful loss for a little girl to suffer the loss of her father. <laughs> but she makes the mistake that most women in this day and age do. She goes to pick a husband. That's part of the where you are the shield that the Aesir owe her for killing her father. She picks him based on only one aspect of his being. She figures, well, if he's got the prettiest feet, that's going to be Balder. And she picks him, and it ends up being you. Walking around on the beach, I guess, in a little sand scrub. <laughs> but there's something much more powerful at play here. On the mountaintop, you have the snows, and they melt, and they run across the land and the rivers, and water picks up all of this energy, and as this water goes from a cloud to snow to water, it melts in water, it purifies itself. It becomes very much a, a living element capable of carrying life and, and all kinds of positive energy, else we wouldn't use it in the ideas of the naming ceremony, and Christians wouldn't use it for baptism. And Muslims use it, and Jews use it, and the Hindus bathe in the river Ganges. There is no limit in every mythology we come across of the value of pure spring mountain water. And that water flows across the land, picking up ideas, giving life to trees, to plants, to animals, to humans. And then it flows back into the sea, where it flows out the sea, it evaporates, becomes a cloud goes back over the mountain and falls down. And it does so in a pattern. It does so in a pattern in accordance with the wind. And that same cyclical pattern is flow. The order is that God that governs all of that. Yeah, and Scotty is the important element that purifies water as it carries life to everything we look at. 
when you look at the importance of water across the world, it's almost, it's so powerful. It's almost the idea that the expression of life is done exclusively through the use of water. Everything that lives, breathes, crawls, walks, talks, thinks, eats, is made primarily of water, especially their mind, especially our brain. If you lose 10% of your water, you start to hallucinate, see things. If you lose 12%, you start to die. And there's countless studies of people that have taken drops of water and frozen them, and the patterns that they create change in accordance with the energy that is given off to that water. They pray over it. In a Christian prayer, it forms a peculiar type of pattern. Or a Hindu mantra, it has a different type of pattern. If it just comes out of the city tap water, it forms an ugly blob. It's no pure crystalline structure. It's, uh, it's carrying all the negative energy of all the homes it has gone past. And it's, it keeps alive. But is it what we want? Is it have the, does it have the same property as that water that Scotty governs as it goes from a cloud to snow to pure spring water? So when you look at this combination of Jordan and Scotty and the elements that they're so powerfully associated with, and then you look at what New Ward is responsible for, why he's basically responsible for the very well-being of who we are and our ability to express the positive ideas of what we might become, how we might be successful, how we might journey through this world. That water flows across the land in wonderful spiral and circular patterns. It takes this path of least resistance and it begins to whirl and eddy and it bubbles and it has oxygen and life and it picks up minerals and it feeds the fish and it picks up all kinds of positive stuff. This combination of New Orleans and Scotty has more of an influence on our life than we might understand or imagine. It's so easy to get caught up in the very powerful and dramatic ideas of old Thor and the, and the martial aspect of the power of who they are or the beautiful, powerful aspect of Freya because, well, she may be a goddess of love, but she's also this goddess that gets half of the slain. What about these two? That calm, peaceful, powerful, slow, unyielding aspect of the tides that flow across this planet. This is New York. This is why he is third. When you look at some of the stuff that, well, I'll continue on. Then Scotty went up into the mountains and dwelt in Grimehammer, and she goes for the more part on snowshoes and with a bow and arrow and shoots beast. She is called Snowshoe Goddess or Lady of the Snowshoes. So it is said, Thrymir just called where the Aussie dwelt, be he the hideous giant. But now Scotty abides, pure bride of the gods, pure bride of the gods. Just like the snow that falls through that beautiful sky, it, it condenses, it rids itself of any kind of negative energy or connotation or anything that pure, it purifies itself, just like a reverse osmosis when we boil water. We purify it, it turns to steam, it gets rid of all of those impurities so we might consume it. Scotty is that pure bride of the gods in her father's ancient freehold up on the mountain, that fresh fallen snow that we, everybody loves to play in, everybody loves to treasure, everyone wants to drink fresh water off of the glacier. This is the pure bride of the gods. This is the partner of New York, this god of the sea, who sends that raw material that she might purify. Njord and Noatan begot afterward two children. The son was called Frey and the daughter Freya. They were fair of face and mighty. They were strong and beautiful. Frey is the most renowned of the Aesir. He rules over the rain and the shining of the sun and therewith all the fruit of the earth. And it is good to call on him for fruitful seasons and peace. He also governs the prosperity of men. So, as we see in the rich that as we see in so many other patterns. You have the grandparents, the great-grandparents, the grandparents, the parents, they have a son, takes a bride, and then their children, the grandchildren of that original couple, build this, build these, have the foundational blocks of building a civilization. Their names represent that. If you look up at Greeks, you can see that. When Odin and Skadi, or when Odin and Frigga have Balder, they have this son that might 
give a proper judgment who in whose in whose home he was to fail for rooms lie as he is strong and beautiful just like them and when he dies there's kind of a vacuum of the nature of the wars about the granny's going to smile she knows what we talked about today their son is Forseti, and he he presents judgments that none may gainsay. We have the same pattern emerging here. So we have Neword and Scotty, and in some cases, their son is she is called Frey's mother and Frey's mother. In some cases, they say it is Nerthus or his or Neword's sister, the Earth. So the sea and the Earth creates this abundance, but a clarification purification of strengthening of the focus of what New York offers to mankind shows up in Frey. He is the most renowned of the Aesir. He's not talked of as a hostage now. He's talked of as being the most renowned of the Aesir. He rules over the rain and the shining of the sun. So now he's got this idea. Now he, he is the father of this wonderful son that brings not only rain but sun. He's almost a solar deity. And they're with all the fruit of the earth. So he governs how well we might live. It's good to call on him for fruitful seasons and for peace. The Gothi operating under the auspices of Forsetti to settle judgments and settle peace disputes might also call on Frey. So peace becomes kind of an important thing between these tribes. Nobody wants to lose unnecessarily. You can sue for a peace. You have Frey, you have Forseti, you have various goddesses that rule over and govern this, this idea of people living in harmony with the world they live in. And I'll probably talk, we'll talk about that next week. But Freya is the most renowned of the goddesses. Holy cow, now all of a sudden there's a daughter. She's not talked about as a hostage. She's the top dog. That girl just strut out there and took over. She's like, check this out. I got it. She is, has in heaven the dwelling called Folkman. And wheresoever she rides to the stripe, she has one half of the hill and Odin half, as it is said here. Folkman, which is called where Freya rules, degrees of seats in the hall, half the hill she keepeth each day, and half Odin half. Her hall, says room there, is great and fair. She got, so she's got two places. One is an afterlife of warriors, those that die on the battlefield that are buried in the mass grave. There is a goddess there to escort them to a hall, either Volkvanger or Valhalla or Ingle. Odin has two halls, she has two halls. This daughter of this god that seems to control the, the, the very building blocks of our universe now has a reach into the realm of the afterlife, what we might look like when we cross over into the moon and gap, much the same way hell does. <laughs> when she goes forth, she drives her cats and sits in a chariot. She is most conformable to man's prayers. And from her name comes the name of honor, Frau, by which noble women are called. So she sets this standard. So not only is Nord this very god of prosperity, now they said his children are these exemplary examples of, of prosperity, of the good things in of an honorable woman, of a noble woman. Uh, she is most conformable to men's prayers. Her daughters literally become, they are treasures. Their name literally means treasure. And that is a great benefit, a boon to mankind, to have that image of beauty to strive for. The face that launched a thousand ships with the greet with the Trojan War, that image of beauty inspires men to greatness. I might attain hope, I might attain Valhalla, where there's Valkyries, there is an image of beauty that inspires a man onto much greater challenges, that makes him want to put forth his best foot, that makes him want to get out there and tussle with somebody that might be more skilled than he is, that wants to stand up and defend everything. Well, now all of a sudden, we've got a source of inspiration here we weren't even expecting. And then when everything is secure and safe, we have this other God, pray, saying, got this. Let's have a little rain. Let's have some abundance. We worked hard and their father governs all of it. 
We have a very powerful imagery of the Lord and Scotty and the powers of water and what it might really mean for us that all ties together a much more beautiful image of what Oshatru can be for people that we, that sometimes we want to skip over because it doesn't immediately feed a sense of self-righteousness or righteous indignation or anger or strength or power. When you have these very calming ideas of beauty that say, you know, it's going to be okay. That's what this God kind of governs. To stand on the shores of the peaceful sea, you can't help but be in awe, in awe of it. To gaze upon a snow-capped mountain, you can't help but be in awe of it and what it represents. And through all of that, there's a one element that runs through it all, and that's water. And that water represents life. Odin, Billy, and Bay carved out of that, that water's expression of life on this planet, they carved out of that as an emblem the ash and the elm to put us on our path. Not to rejoin that great sea, but to rejoin them on a much different ocean of spirituality. There is uh, a lot to be said in paying attention to Songs of love are well pleasing to her, and it is good to call on her for furtherance and love. When you, when you take a look at all of that, when you begin to look at the, what water really does for us, pure water, um, you can charge it with spiritually, with even in the baptism. When you look at these special wells, these special springs, these holy places, this is where water usually emerged from the earth. When uh, Charlemagne cast those 12 judges out to sea, Forseti showed up and cast his axe into the ground and a spring emerged, pure water. Um, and it was a holy place. So when we start looking at this, at this faith we want to call Austria, when we start trying to find that location we want to build um, our circle, our church, our tribe, our community, are we looking at the right aspect of it? Are we still looking at what word we might use when really all we need to be focused on is this third of the Aesir to provide that balance that helps even the keel and it all kind of revolves around this most powerful aspect of water. The Lord governs all of it. And I hope that when you start paying attention to this or looking at this or maybe listening to this again or sharing it with somebody else that we that we find a clearer path for our future instead of one that is contaminated with much like the water that travels through the pipes to our homes. It passes through all them other homes and picks up all that negative energy and dirt and smashed, and crushed, and it'll keep us alive. But for the most part, it doesn't have the same living effect that the water, the fresh spring water coming down the mountain might have us. So when we look at all that, look at the Orn as that fresh flowing water, that that living idea that helps us flourish because when it's all said and done that's exactly what it is that wonderful beautiful clear water that gentle rain that that passions that flow through us water is that thing that allows us to live life to see clearly to understand that everything we're walking in everything we see when we walk in the forest and in the redwoods are the perfect example you see these great magnificent creatures that are very much every bit as alive as we are that communicate with each other. They are a pure expression of life based on water. They don't know anything else but to grow grand, to use the water that's available. They absorb, I don't know, something like 30% of the water through their leaves and up at the top through that great mist, that pure water that floats across and fogs that come in in the morning on the coast of California. <coughs> New York is a part of that. Water is not something that was created. Water is something that's always been here along with fire. One of them is most assuredly a part of our life. One of them is the most assuredly a part of our ability to thrive. So the next time you go to stand by the sea, when you raise a horn, when you speak about the well, 
I mean, think about that. Every day the dews fall in the dales and the norns you to refresh and water the roots of Igersil. Let's let that fresh, clean water, that idea of which comes from Niord, through Scotty, purified, comes down. Let it refresh our roots as well. We might thrive and grow and become something more. And it all revolves around water and it all centers in the orb. I think that's pretty much my presentation on the orb this evening. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute your microphone. I'd be happy to discuss any of it with you. Stop the recording. <laughs>